Okay, so hi everyone, uh, glad to be here today uh, uh, to talk about Hadoop, machine learning, and SaaS. And so I wanted to start with a brief introduction. Um, so again, my name is Ofra Mendelevich. Uh, I run the data science group here at Hortonworks. And um, what that means is uh, my team, we help our customers with uh, uh, data science projects that they want to do on Hadoop. Uh, so that means machine learning, advanced statistical algorithm, natural language processing, all, all that kind of uh, kind of applications. And um, uh, I wanted to pass it over now to Wayne uh, to introduce himself. Wayne. Well, thanks a lot, Alfer. Um, my name is Wayne Thompson. I'm a data scientist lead here at SAS uh, in a similar role as Ofer. I uh, also work on uh, product development and product management. We've got a ton to show you today, so I'm going to be brief and just pass it right back over to Ofer for some of our presentation. Okay, thanks, Wayne. So uh, we wanted to start to give a little bit of a bigger picture and talk about, you know, so in, in the world of what we now call big data, we have a lot of new data types coming in. So it used to be, uh, you know, uh, mostly transactional data and uh, relational data, but now we have, you know, things from social networks, we have geolocation, we got server logs, a lot of uh, text process uh, type data, and that creates a sort of a pressure for the architecture uh, of data in a lot of organizations. So, I mean, you can see in the slide, there's expected to be a lot more data coming in in the next three years, uh, 40 zettabytes of data by 2020. and all these types of, of data um, f force a change. And um, in, this, in this slide, what you see is, you know, Hadoop is now uh, being adopted by many organizations as, as kind of a component in the data architecture um, to help with this change. We call this the, the data lake architecture. So what that means is uh, we can put the data lake, you know, wants to go for the analogy of, you know, uh, the data is the water, and you put all the, all the water in one, one big lake, and we put all the stuff in one place. Um, and we see this architecture you see here in the picture is, is very common nowadays, and it complements all your existing uh, tools and systems where you store data and where you process data. All right? Um, let me go to the next slide here. Um, Hadoop uh, not only allows you to store a lot of data uh, rather inexpensively and um, store a lot, of, a lot of data in raw form. Uh, it also allows us to use the data and, and explore it and uh, process it in an iterative manner. So as you can see here in sort of the current reality before you put Hadoop in place, um, a lot of the stuff is very, um, we call it a repeatable linear process. It's very, we know how to do things. We kind of uh, determine the list of questions, we design the solution, we collect the data, we ask the question, and we, we kind of have a, a process by which we kind of do these things. With Hadoop, you have new types of data, different variety of data, some of it is text, some of it is audio, some of it is transactional, and you can really e integrate and iterate with the data a lot faster and, and run these quick iterations. And I'll talk about it in, in a later slide a little bit more, but this allows us to access the data in different patterns, and um, it, it, it creates a lot of more um, productivity for data scientists. All right, so I wanted to talk uh, a little bit in more detail about three examples I like to talk about uh, with regards to how Hadoop helps data scientists. So I've been, I've been doing the data science for quite a while now, uh, previously at Yahoo and other places, and these are some of the, the things that I've learned that I've, I've seen help in this process. So the first one is Hadoop has this thing called schema on read, which helps uh, be more productive, and I'll show this in the next slide. Then Hadoop is also very, very useful for pre-processing. So when we do modeling work in machine learning, a lot of times um, we have to pre-process the raw data into the feature matrix, and Hadoop is very, very good at that. And finally, you know, a lot of people talk about, I'm more interested in the third bullet, is how do we get more data to build better models and get better outcomes from that? So on the first point, uh, move to the next slide. So 
in, in a, most organizations that, that I'm talking to in my role at Hornworks is, uh, this is, this is sort of the picture that, that happens. So if you look at the top part where it's, I think it's blue or light blue, um, so imagine I'm a data scientist and I wanna, I have a model, a predictive model that I want to uh, improve, okay? And so I wanna add another data set to it, let's say, uh, social data or some sensor data from a car or something like that. And um, I have the data available, but uh, usually there's no real easy place to store it. So what I do is I go to my you know, IT team and I say, hey, I need a, another table in the database or I need another, a few columns in the database and I'll store my data. And that usually is what I call a schema change project because, you know, relational database, we typically keep them very strict. The schema is, is uh, very strict and changing it is not an easy thing. Uh, and usually it takes about six months and a lot of people tell me I'm, I'm optimistic on that too. Um, so you change the, you change the schema. After, as a data scientist though, six months later, IT or maybe it's nine months if, if we're not that fortunate, I get uh, I get the call and say, hey, now you can start kind of collecting your data and storing it. So we start storing the data. Now I have to wait another three months or so until I get enough data to actually run my idea and see if my new type of data that I think will help the model is actually going to do that or not. And um, that cycle tends to be really long. Uh, what happens with Hadoop is because it's what we call schema on read, it, you don't have to change the schema to store new data. You just store it as you want and you read it and, and apply a schema to it when you read, read it from, from HDFS. What happens is what you see on the bottom part, uh, I want to put my new data in, I just put it on HDFS, I only have to wait the three months to collect enough data and then I can start my experimentation right away. So. Whether the model is, is working or not, sometimes I have to repeat these cycles a couple of times because I have new ideas. But you can see how the, the time to sort of the time to innovate is much shortened. So that's one of, one of the interesting ideas and, and one of the things that I've seen that Hadoop helps a lot. Um, the other thing is, of course, uh, the transformation of pre-processing. So in, in machine learning, we, we create what typically is called a feature matrix, which is uh, features we selected that are predictive of a model, uh, and we'll see a few examples later in the demos today. Um, and 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 we have instances like users or items or whatever we want to model on. And uh, the raw data we take, we create those features from, could be anything. It could be textual. It could be audio. It could be transactional. And some of the boxes in the middle you see here are the types of operations that you might want to do. And this type of work is actually uh, takes a lot of time and a lot of the, the magic of sort of doing machine learning correctly is figuring out what features are the correct ones, the most predictive ones. And But once you know that, transforming raw data into feature matrix is very parallelizable and very well uh, achieved on a Hadoop cluster. If you have all your raw data and it could be terabytes or petabytes or data and you want to transform that into a feature matrix, that's a perfect job for Hadoop, and I see that quite often uh, being done that way. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about here is, of course, where you know, better, better, larger data sets essentially create better outcomes. So there's a, a bunch, there's a little bit of research being done on that. Uh, one of the things is mentioned here in this um, in this paper by Banco and Brill from 2001 about natural language processing. But generally, we know that in a lot of cases, we can add either more examples to, for supervised learning or more features to learn by. And in both of those cases, uh, if we do that in the proper way, we can just get better predictors, better outcomes. And that's what we all want. So um, with those three things, um, I wanted to show you also a little bit of a kind of a map of the different types of data science or machine learning tasks that we, we typically talk about. Um, and I split it into two parts. One is more like discovery or descriptive analytics and the other one is more prediction. So with discovery, we talk about clustering. Clustering is where you take a bunch of points and you just wanna detect if there's some natural grouping 
that is uh, appropriate. A lot of use cases for that could be a segmentation of customers, for example. Um, outlier detection is when you take uh, a bunch of, uh, again, objects or items that you want to model on, and you're trying to find these items that are anomalous, that are, that are not like many others. And typically, we find you know, fraud detection or things of that nature to come into that category. Um, rule mining is finding frequent item sets or co-occurrence patterns. Very popular in retail when you want to do market basket analysis and things of that nature. Now, prediction is where you want to predict um, something you don't know about an item. So it breaks down into classification where the predicted value is a category. It could be a yes or no, or it could be uh, more, more, than one more, one, more than a binary uh, category. Uh, regression is where you want to actually predict the value. So for example, you want to predict, uh, let's say uh, you come to the hotel and you want to predict uh, how much money a person will spend when they come to the hotel. So you predict a, va a dollar value, a number, not a, not a category. Um, Recommendation is another type of prediction. It's a little bit different, but this is what we're used to uh, think about when we talk about Amazon or Netflix. Uh, so, for example, uh, you want to predict which movies I might like. What we've all seen that. Or we want to predict a, a product that a person might purchase. So we'll talk about that. Uh, I also have at the bottom here, just to note, there's, there's a whole other category of scientists doing biology or physics or uh, chemistry, genomics, medicine, whatever, uh, that use big data. And the, the word data science sometimes is uh, confusing, and so I put them in a whole different category. They usually use big data. They might or might not use machine learning in that, um, but they just they have a tons of data. So a good example is high energy physics, where they want to find a certain particle, you know, from uh, from an experiment, and it's just it's it's a huge amounts of data, but they may or may not use the techniques we're talking about here in this context. So that's kind of the, the overview of of the types of techniques we have, um, and typically the the data science work that I see is very iterative, and that's another thing that's really important. So when you when you go to build a new model, let's say you go through these steps. You want to first acquire the data. Uh, that means you grab it from whatever other source it, it's there. And that's what I talked about earlier. If it's already on Hadoop, on the data lake, it's all there. That increases the productivity of data scientists because they don't have to go and acquire the data where, wherever it is. It's already there for them. Um, cleaning the data means you know data comes in with a lot of typos, errors, uh, some missing data, things like that. Uh, then you kind of go and you explore the data and you try to figure out, well, what do I have here? What are some good features from a model, things of that nature? We use a lot of visualization in that process as well. That helps a lot. Um, and then after you do that, you usually kind of have a hypothesis and you say, okay, I'm going to build a model. I think I can predict this variable using those variables and I'm going to try that out. I'm going to model that. I'm going to evaluate my results. And you know, usually you're not successful on the first round, um, and you iterate again and again until you get it right, but eventually when you are, then you, you go and you deploy the model, and then you monitor its performance. So this is kind of the typical uh, cycle. Um, and SAS, you know, is... I, the reason I wanted to show you all the cycles because SAS is sort of... Uh, solves big parts of, of, of these, uh, if not all of these uh, steps in the cycle. And, you know, with our partnership, Hortonworks partnership with SAS, as you can see here, uh, there is a, a red box uh, and, and that shows kind of stuff that gets integrated on top of YARN. And we're very excited about this because now you can run the SAS in-memory statistics and visual statistics both as part of the YARN uh, platform and directly access the data that's on a Hadoop cluster. And so with that, I wanted to hand it over to Wayne. All right, well, thank you very much. Let me go ahead and share my desktop.
All right, Kim, I uh, just want to get a, vi uh, a visual or actually a, a audio confirmation. You can see my slide. Yep, I can, Wayne. Excellent. Thanks, by the way, for organizing this. You know, um, we're really excited working with HortonWorks. Um, this is a collaborative effort. You know, our goal is very, uh, very defined and very crisp, by the way. And, you know, together we want to be the number one analytical workload running in Hadoop. And, you know, we have HortonWorks people here on site, and we've done a lot of work to um, develop product and so forth. And I also want to emphasize, too, that SAS is just really proud and happy to be part of the Hadoop community. It's a very long-standing community, community, and, um, you know, we feel it's important. And why? Because it's important to our customers. Uh, we have many of our customers moving quickly to Hadoop for many of the obvious reasons. But what I'd like to do is spend more time, and we have some demos today, too. We're not just going to show you PowerPoints, but... Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of our objectives. And the suite of this is really uh, SAS in-memory analytics. And I think uh, distributed is, is the game today. You've got to have your analytics fully distributed because of the size and complexity of the data. And the other aspect that we're trying to deliver was something called the SAS laser analytics server within the Hadoop Hortonworks cluster SAS laser analytic server is that in order to be a key player here, you just don't want to be doing model building. You know, that's not where the game is at. You have to, first of all, cover data preparation, transformations, as Ofer talked about. You've got to look at data anomalies and do exploratory analysis. And once you do a model tournament where you're trying several different statistical and machine learning methods, you've got to have a way to evaluate those models and then deploy them into production. So our goal, first of all, is to make sure that we're doing full spectrum analytics. And I also want to say kind of the new word for distributed in my mind is interactive. We want to make this uh, experience the way that your mind works and thinks. You've got to be able to, you know, turn on a dime and add new features, try new settings and so forth, and do this all without dropping the data to disk. So let's talk about that even some more. Look at the next slide. Now, as I work, and I, I just got back from the International Machine Learning Conference in Beijing, and we had a workshop there, everyone, just about everyone, slings code. They like to write code. And so for that audience, um, we've delivered a new product within Hadoop, um, and it's called SAS In-Memory Statistics for Hadoop. It's a programming tool. And the best way for me to describe the programming tool is show you momentarily. I have a lot of customers that like to point and click, clickety-click with the mouse, and do that in a very visual way. That you like to look at visuals. And so there we have another sister product called SAS Visual Statistics. And I will show you a demo of that during the last section. But both of them leverage this back end laser analytics server. And if you look at the in-memory statistics, as I described, you know, we really have the full spectrum kind of package here. I kind of joke with some people internally here at SAS, I call it the Cancun package for machine learning in Hadoop because you get everything here. You get, as you see at the top left, the ability to do some data management. You know, you've got to wrangle and get the data assembled before you develop models. And then there's lots of uh, summary things that we see down at the bottom left to do Tukey-style exploratory analysis. I mean, you've got to develop things like kernel density estimates. You've got to look at histograms and box plots, and not just look at measures of centrality, but look at measures of spread. And then, of course, you know, up in the top middle, you've got your bread and butter stuff that you would expect. And if you have a machine learning package, even though we call this statistics, it really blends in the machine learning because you can see we have text analytics. And it's important to integrate and fuse data from lots of sources. So we'll see an example of doing some topic generation. And then uh, Ofer did a nice job talking about recommendation systems. And we'll take some real data from a company called Yelp, and I'll show you their website. And we'll actually build some product recommendations for various businesses. And then the real key thing, too, still the big bang for your buck is the predictive modeling. General linear models, random forests, which, again, are ensembles of trees. 
And then we have, uh, I, I think Ofer called it uh, association rule mining and path analysis, but we have those things. So this is kind of just an inventory of the underlying task, and as it shows, it's cyclical and supports the full cycle. Let me talk a little bit about how this works, you know, from an architectural standpoint. You know, first of all, you've got to have a Hortonworks uh, data platform. And, and keep in mind that, you know, we, we do a lot of certification and so forth here, and we want to make sure that this works well for you as a customer. And you start off, for example, with something here, like I have a head node, and I have a fairly small cluster. I'll actually be running on a 10 data node cluster with one head node, but for uh, representation here, I have four data nodes and one head node. Some people call this a general and, and their various captains. But notice, too, um, this box here represents the Hortonworks cluster. And so, first of all, the, the thing that I want to emphasize is we're bringing the analytics to the data. So if you look at the next slide, the first thing that happens is the data gets striped across all the data nodes. All right, it's nicely balanced and partitioned. If you want to make sure that you have all records for a certain customer account ID on a certain node, you can do that. But everything is nice and balanced in memory. And then what I want you to remember is we never drop that data back down to disk unless you tell the system, hey, I'm done, write this back down to disk, or promote it as a permanent table. So it's kind of like a magic carpet. The data is suspended in memory. And if we can layer this up in memory, we can be interactive. We can be fast. We can be nimble. And then you have these products over on the right, and I don't want to be too marketing with you, but you've got to have some kind of product. So you have your in-memory statistics product where you can write code, or you have your visual statistics product where you can use the UI. And in orange, it sends requests to the laser analytics server. Hortonworks has already provisioned the data from the Hadoop file system and loaded it into memory. Some results are done across the uh, distributed co-located cluster, and then result sets are returned back to the edge node, just a SAS server sitting outside of the cluster, just results packets are passed back to this edge node, and then are displayed back on your web client for viewing. Let's dive a little deeper, okay? Let's work from this particular example from right to left. Um, I decided not to animate a lot of these slides, but um, here I'm using a web client, and a common theme here is analytics on the go, anywhere, anytime. So you want to be able to have this accessible to you from a thin browser. And then this is just some grammar you learn to write, okay? It's proc. It's a procedural type of language. And you have to name it something. So we called it MSTAT. That stands for in-memory statistics. And then you say, well, I want to analyze some data. Well, in this case, DAT1 is already loaded over here into memory, okay? It's suspended, waiting for somebody to go against it. And another key is it's keyed up for multi-user to where a pod of data scientists can all go at together the same data loaded in memory. Concurrency is very important. And then you simply issue something like a summary statement. And I want to get for a measure, a continuous label X, I want to get the mean. And so it sends its instructions via the edge node to go ahead and compute this sample mean over on the laser analytics server. And if you look here, let's go from A to B to C to D. I know we're having way more fun than you ever expected, but in this case, on the head node, it says, hey, I've got to aggregate and compute all of this information for that mean. So sum up all these X sub I's. And, and get me an average. But first, let me send this down to B instructions to compute partition means across each one of these four data nodes in memory. Okay, and each of these nodes does its work. And then via message processing interface, these nodes can talk to one another, communicate back and forth. Uh, we don't have to reshuffle or reissue the data on different nodes. It gets put on one node so we don't have to map it back down and put it on a different node. It's not time consuming. But then it basically, it gets the answer set for its partition calculation for each, you know, jth node for which I have four. And then it basically sends that back.
back to the head node where it actually could be aggregated on a data node, but here I'm showing it's aggregated on a head node, and we get the overall average in item C. And now I have basically a result set, an average, and that gets sent back over to the edge node and passed back down to my web client, and I see a value in my browser. Pretty simple, pretty neat. And by the way, this works for multi-path iterative analytics too. If I'm trying to do some kind of objective function like minimize a loss, um, at each iteration we evaluate this, we do not write the data back down to disk, and the important thing to keep in mind, please keep this in mind, this box here is Hortonworks, SAS is installed inside of that cluster and does its entire computational work inside of the Hortonworks cluster. Now, from an advantage standpoint, a few perspectives. Just from a bigger picture, as I mentioned, if we look on the right, um, again, we're trying to make everything kind of thin clients on the go. So whether it's SAS Studio that I'll show or visual statistics, you can get through your browser. And as I mentioned, you want to have this data because you got a, this big data lake and you want to queue up this data for all your data scientists to work on kind of in champion challenger way, much like I talked about tournament modeling. And everybody can use that same table. And the most important thing is you've got to have software that's interactive. And over on the left, in terms of the laser server itself, um, as I mentioned, one copy of the data. What we do and the way that we're able to, let's say, build a regression model and output the residuals and then build another model with using those residuals as the input without striping the data back down to disk is we generate temporary tables and then operate on those temporary tables. And then when your session's done, those just disappear and everything writes back down to the Hadoop file system. And you can do this on a local machine, but get the bang for your buck and get a nice Hortonworks cluster and do this and distribute it in PP style. So um, I'm going to turn it back to Ofer um, and do a little bit about our use case and then I'll follow up with the demo. Thanks Wayne. Um, so we wanted to move over to our first use case we're going to demo today and, and this is a recommendation system that we talked about earlier. So. I want to give you a, a quick overview of, of what that is and how that works, and then we'll dive back into the demo. So um, why do people use recommendation systems? Well, there's a bunch of statistics that you can see here on the page um, that have been collected over by, by various people. But generally speaking, the thing I like to think about, it, it's, it's pretty clear. I mean, whoever has used Netflix or Amazon know that this is a good, this is a good user experience. So it drives people to find new things they haven't thought about finding, finding very useful products to buy. So it tends to increase sales, increase sales depending on your business by um, quite a bit. And sales could be, it could also increase engagement with not necessarily monetary sales if you want to get people to interact with your website in a different way. Um, and people find that recommendation engines work pretty well. So the recommendations tend to be high quality, so people use them. Um, and, and that creates you know, even more um, engagement. Now, loyalty is another thing. A lot of uh, customers of websites that have recommendation systems become loyal because it's, it's a very, you don't have to search for something. You actually find it sort of automatically. So people like that, and it creates uh, a sense of, oh, this is, this is a good website. I like coming there. I'll come there again, and so they come back again. So it creates this loyalty. So <clears throat> all these things are very important. And we can see a couple of examples Pandora, TripAdvisor, Netflix, Yelp, there's many others. Amazon is a very famous one, of course. Uh, even YouTube does recommendations today. So this is a very uh, common technique. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how to do it to give you a kind of a, a couple of slides on that, and then we'll go to the demo. Um, so I talked before our pre-processing. Pre Again, in this case, we have a lot of raw data. Uh, sometimes, if it's Netflix, for example, we have explicit ratings. Uh, people say, okay, this movie is five stars or four stars or three stars or, or rate a product. Those are, those are ratings. Uh, sometimes we just um, understand uh, people's um, interest in a product based on page views. Sometimes it's from uh, uh, comments and textual information. All this data flows into what we call the, <clears throat> the product rating matrix. And so what you see here on the right-hand side, so imagine rows are users, user 101, user 102, et cetera. 
Then you got, uh, in this case, I chose the Netflix example, so it's a movies, you know, Epic or X-Men or The Hobbit. Um, and we have to take this raw data and create this feature matrix. Now, the, the numbers represent, you know, the rating. So we know that User 101 uh, gave a rating of 5 uh, to Epic, uh, gave a rating of 2 to X-Men, and a 4 to The Hobbit. And then we have these question marks which, are, which represent that, that, that we don't have a rating for the movie Argo from User 101, and we don't have a rating of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean from User 101 as well. And so there's a lot of missing values in this matrix. And the way you think mathematically about a recommendation engine is actually to predict the missing values, to predict these question marks. And this is why, because this looks like a matrix, a lot of people call this problem uh, matrix completion. You sort of complete the matrix from the missing values. But as you can see here, in this case, the algorithm predicted, for example, that uh, a one rating will be for Argo. That means that user 101 will probably not like Argo very much. And Pirates of the Caribbean is three. And so what you do is if you can, this is, of course, a small example of only five movies, but if you can imagine, you know, tens of thousands of movies and tens of millions of users, you can edit a lot, really large scale. And then, um, essentially, when you make a recommendation, you take the movies that are unseen by user 101 that are highest rated. So you take the fives, and if there's no any more fives, it's like the fours or four and a half or whatever. And that's how you actually do the recommendation. So you predict this first, and then for each user, you take the ones that are most likely to, to be liked by that user, and you show it to her, okay? So that's how recommendation system works. Um, let me move over back to Wayne to show us this uh, as a demo. All right, thank you very much. All right, um, what I'd like to do is um, use some real data. It's been out there for a data mining competition in the past, so you might want to Google or check that out. Um, a lot of people know about Yelp reviews. I'll actually show you the website momentarily. Um, but we got uh, reviews, I believe, for about 15 different businesses in and around the hey, scale. Wayne? Yes. Wayne, are you showing yeah. your desktop or your slides? I'm showing a slide right now. Okay, great, perfect, thank you. No problem, uh, Kim. I, I've, I've got this nailed, nailed down now. So, okay. um, one thing we like to do is take these 15,000 different businesses, and the first thing I have is I just like to look at the data. Um, Ofer um, did some work to read in some JSON files and did a little standardization, and then you saw how I could just pick that data up, lift it up from within the Hadoop cluster, and load it for analysis. And then I like to do um, just some, first some exploration because there's all these different reviews about these businesses and I sure don't have time to read all 15,000 of them. So I'm gonna see if I can't uh, create some topics from the reviews, meaning I'm gonna do a little bit of text analysis. And then down at the bottom, uh, remember we also in this case have some ratings for these businesses. People have actually gone out and rated them on a scale to one to five and Ofer called that an explicit recommendation system where I have an objective score to model with. And so I'm gonna take these users and all these businesses which formulate my items. A lot of times you see the items be things like books or, or um, clothing items on Amazon or music on Pandora, but actually the items in this case are businesses that I wanna to recommend to users who are within the Yelp community. And if I come over here, um, can you see that still? I probably need to go ahead and stop sharing and share again. Okay. I don't see your desktop. Yep, I'm gonna work on that just in a second here. Share, monitor. Sorry, folks. How about now? Perfect. 
Sorry about that. It takes just a second to set up some of this. Got a lot of moving parts. Um, there's the actual Yelp site. It's live. And, and this data actually seems to be from Scottsdale, Arizona, in and around the university. And so I go and let's say I want to look at things at Scottsdale. Uh, maybe I want to find a wine bar. And if I just press in enter and so like what it does is this thing is more kind of search based, at least what I can tell. It's it's based upon highest highest rating and most viewed. And so maybe now what I want to do is take some of these uh, ratings and also reviews about these businesses and see if I can actually incorporate an explicit recommendation system into it. Now, the first thing I want to do is you can see here, too, that for each one of these businesses, they actually put it into a geographical map. And so um, I want to make sure I have kind of the right data that OFER has prepared for me. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to Visual Analytics and just do a quick little bit of exploration. So I've got the data loaded, and I've specified the business name as a geography. So I just drag and drop that onto my desktop, and blammo, just like that, I get a map. Pretty cool, and each of these circles represents a specific uh, business. And if I come over here too and do something, you know, like uh, hover over it, we can see that there happens to be just one review count for that particular business. Um, the other thing I can do is um, uh, I can apply some filters and things of that nature. I've already done that here. Uh, one thing I want to do is kind of redo this and drag and drop business name and then go over here to properties and um, that looks fine so here in my example I just have some of the business names and so forth and I can just get a feel for how they're distributed I could I, I, I augment those and add in the star rating and so forth but given our time what I really like to do is come in here and do some analysis on one of these variables to look at some of the topics across the variable businesses so I've actually set this review variable, and again, um, I'm working, I believe, with just about 15,000, although I've done a little bit of filtering here, and I've specified this as a document variable. So if I come over here to something like my word cloud, there's actually a lot of machine learning behind the scenes here. Um, it's not just doing counts and so forth, but what I want to do is say, hey, let's have no more than uh, 10 topics displayed. And then I'm going to use matrix factorization, what some people call a singular value decomposition, SVD. And I'm going to use some things like term weights and so forth, and I want to make sure the resolution is high. And then um, when I label these topics, I want to say, well, let's, let's have at least eight uh, terms that are visible so that you can see that. Now what it will actually do is it will go through and create a term by matrix a term by document matrix of term frequency so that we are actually counting all the you know counts across all of these and then it will use the SVD to actually generate for me these latent factors that's essentially what these SVDs do they're kind of global representations across the document corpus and you can see that this is our first uh, topic so it has something to do with pizza, Italian, pasta, meatballs, wine, and so forth. And that looks pretty good. It looks pretty reasonable. We have another one down here, for example, burgers, fries, and so forth. So right away, what I've been able to do is just distill all of this data, all of these reviews, where I've concatenated the reviews into one review per business. And I've been able to generate some of these topics. Now, the next thing I like to do is if you think about my path and my demo path and so forth, I then like to use those topics as part of my recommendation. See, when you build a recommender, you can not only use the ratings for the businesses, but you can incorporate other information like how long the business has been in place, revenue, and of course, mo most importantly, textual analysis and what the people are saying about the businesses and that might help me create better recommendations. Now over here I was in visual analytics just to do some quick and dirty analysis. I mapped the data and I generated some of the topics. I'm going to jump over here to something called SAS Studio because now I'm the data scientist and I want to write some code. And I specifically want to write the SAS in-memory statistics code for Hadoop. And if you look here too, 
Um, SAS Studio is nice. It's a little web browser. It's kind of the new programming interface for SAS. And you can see it runs on Google and Safari and so forth. And I've already dragged and dropped one of my programs here called Yelp.sass. And let me go ahead and put this into Maximize View. And I'll just do a Control Plus so those of you at home or in the office can see a little bit better. Now, I have submitted some of this code already to get us and speed us along. I've got a port number established for my session, my laser session running within that Hadoop cluster. And I've taken laser, proc laser, and it says take the ratings data right here and load that into memory. Okay, and let's use all nodes on the cluster. And then I also want to take, make sure I have those uh, documents that I did reviews on and created topics, and I want to load those. So I'm basically just loading some data. And then I wanted to also set up a stop list. So I'm going to recreate these topics, but instead of using this drag and drop approach, I'm going to write some code to do it. And then I'm going to start my laser server, and I've submitted all that code. So let's just see a little bit about this Hortonworks cluster that I'm running on. Let's see how big it is and what tables I've already got loaded out there. So what you do is you make sure that this is in interactive mode because PROC MSTAT is a run group processing type procedure. Once I submit it, it stays in memory, and then I just hammer at it. I just bang at it with my analysis. Do this, do that, do this, do that, and never drop it to disk. So I'm going to submit that, and here's my nice little cluster. Thank you, Hortonworks. Um, you can see that this is the name of the server, and you can see that I have basically uh, nine data nodes, and it looks like I have one head node and support information. And then these are the tables. They're not humongous, but anytime you're doing recommendation systems, you're dealing with very sparse data. The computations can be tough, and of course, Textual analysis is also tough. And I want to take a peek at the data. So I'm just going to say, uh, fetch some of the observations, the, you know, five observations and for these variables for both the review data and also the ratings data. So notice how I can just select another chunk of the code and submit it. Now, if I scroll up here, um, this again, represents review comments for one business. Now, I will have the business label, such as Starbucks, you know, Scottsdale, uh, when I do my analysis. But you can see I have here the concatenated review for that business. By the way, I put this in the file record in my stop list, so I didn't worry about cleaning that out here. But you can just see, take a look at the data. I mean, fetch or print, or if you're using Another language like head and tail, just taking a look at the data is probably the most valuable tool you can use for data mining to start with. And then what I like to do is I like to do some text parsing. So I'm going to redo a little bit of what I did before, where I'm going to say, take this table, Yelp review, N3000 Yelp review, and do text parsing. And then compute an SVD, and I want to compute 30 latent factors, and do not do stemming or tagging. And then when I do my uh, topics, I want to label the top 10 terms associated with that topic. Now, this is going to take, you know, and before it normally would take probably um, hours to run and on some systems. This would take about 28 seconds to run in this instance. Again, what it's doing is it go it's going through, and I could, in fact, do something like a typical collaborative filtering model where I did something like K nearest neighbors. Um, I can also do something like an ensemble model where I combine both a SVD, uh, a KNN model together to form a hybrid. But, you know, it's going through this very sparse matrix that um, Ofer talked about and computing you know, this SVD dimension, and then just like that, I get back my 30 topics. And so, again, you can see with my label of 10 turns per topic, just looking through these, they're pretty clean. And, you know, this is real data. I'm not making this up, and this is what the tool found. And I'm really amazed at how well some of this, you know, matrix factorization and text parsing works. And Many of you may have played around with the Netflix competition, but that was used extensively, matrix factorization with a temporal effect to win that competition. Well, there's my 30 topics. So let's finish up this so we can move on to our next session. And I'm going to run a recommendation. So there I write proc recommend. 
And then I simply say, create me a project. I could have called this RS Hadoop SAS, but I called it rs.yelp. That's just the name of the project. And then pass me the item, the user, and then the ratings variable. And if I did not have ratings implicit, then I would have to create ratings based upon perhaps something like click view or how many times, count, so forth. And then I'm basically going to just take and run a clustering method. And I'm going to write in those topics that I had here, those 30 topics that I generated from my SVD. And I'm going to use this k-means method as my clustering technique to then in turn generate a prediction. And then I'm going to do a little fancy work here just to write that out a little cleaner. So this will run very quickly. Again, against all of that data, distribute it across those nine data nodes running entirely in the Hadoop cluster. Data is not pulled out over to the SAS edge node. And in fact, if I look at the log here and go down, um, if we look at the example where I ran the text parsing, um, that ran, in this case, in 29 seconds. So I did all of the document topic creation in 29 seconds. And then I built my actual recommendation engine and project in 1.3 seconds. And let's look at some results so that that kind of becomes a little clearer to you. But you know, first of all, you get a lot of output that shows you what the SVD dimensions are and so forth. And I can look at iterative plots and, and use holdout data and so forth. But at the end of the day, you know, I asked it to do a prediction for two users that I knew were in the database, Mary Clark and John Thompson. And for each one of those, we got the top five restaurants that they would like to visit. We got our rate, rating, and the rating, in fact, you can cap if you'd like on a scale of one to five. Here we did not. And it indicates the name of the business. Pretty simple to do. Everyone could do that. So uh, I think that's the end of the recommendation demo. Um, Ofer, do you want to take it over? And perhaps we might, um, given time, uh, drop some of the uh, organics work. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Wayne. Can you share uh, maybe end your share of desktop so we can get back to the slides? Yes. Just did that. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So. Uh, this is offer. So, I think the 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 last thing we wanted to cover. Let me skip this one. I wanted to cover uh, a quick demo, and Wayne, maybe we can do it quickly given the time. Is uh, about predictive model. So, in a predictive model, I want to go through this quickly. Um, in a predictive model, we usually talk about a feature matrix, and in this case, we're showing, showing a supervised model where you got label data. On the top, so and this is an, just a simple example of age and gender and loyalty card, um, and and we want to predict whether uh, the customer will purchase organic products or not, right? So, so imagine that we have all these data and all these features, and then we also have a learning set, a label data. So somebody told us about okay, this person did purchase organics or not. So we have this big matrix to learn from. And from that, we learn a model. It could be a, a regression model, a random forest model, whatever. Uh, there's very, various different types of algorithms to support vector machines. And given this model, what we want to do is we want to take unseen data where we have all the features available, but we want to predict whether they will buy an organic product or not. And we give it to the model, we apply the algorithm, and then we get this result um, whether they're going to buy organics or not. So this is kind of how supervised learning works. And the second demo, we're, we're gonna sh uh, Wayne's going to show you how to do that on, a, on exactly that problem. We have a grocery transaction data set and customer data, and we're going to look through that example. So I'll, I'll transition back to Wayne to show us that. Okay, and I will be very quick so that we can uh, move this along. Okay, um, can you see my desktop? Yep. Excellent. So this is visual statistics, and um, I have a decision tree model. So I'm going to actually develop a decision tree model very quickly. And notice uh, I have some of the information. I'm going to hide this one variable because it's a account customer ID number with a lot of cardinality. I would not want to use this 
as an input. But you can see I have some information here about demographics and age groups and different products and people. And I'm just going to drag these over here and put them as candidate predictors in my decision tree model. And then I have some measures as well, and I'm going to drop those over here and put them in as also candidate predictors. Now, as Ofer described, we have a binary response, which is whether or not someone bought organic products or not. So you actually have to have historical data with an outcome variable, and just like that, Ligety Split, it built my decision tree. And you can see that in each one of these terminal leaves, you get a decision. So you can see here that, you know, 58.52% of the people in that particular leaf node actually um, uh, were candidates for being organic uh, product purchasers. And I can also go down here and see that, you know, via the tree map, where the first row represents the root node, the second row represents the first split. And again, if I want to, I can also go down here and say, like, show in tree is kind of a navigational tool. So it's very easy to kind of look at the data and so forth and, and understand what the purchase propensity is with regards to uh, organics products. And if you look here first, I want to maximize this so you can see a little better. Um, the first split is actually made on age. So people who tend to be younger here, less than 42 years of age, tend to have a greater propensity to buy organic products. And there's some other variables here and so forth, but you can see how the tree has actually gone through in a nice way. Many of you are familiar with decision trees and has uh, done a nice job for me. The other aspect too is um, I can get diagnostic plots in what, as well. So just for brevity, uh, we we need to watch our time. I get a leaf statistics plot, and I can um, do things like uh, look at the count or percentage of observations in each underlying leaf in the tree. Um, the other thing is um, we as data scientists or statisticians like to look at things like lift and ROC, and this is actually the KS statistic, and also misclassification rate so that you can evaluate your model and so forth. Um, what I'd like to do is actually turn these off and just do one or two more things and then pass it back for closure. But um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off these diagnostic plots. And a lot of times what people want to do is use a decision tree as kind of a stratification tool. So I'm going to actually just prune this tree back very heavily. And I can then actually enforce a split if I'd like. I can say, well, you know, as the product manager, we've worked hard on this new customer loyalty program, and its splitting measure, how well this particular variable divides the data relative to others, is not too bad. And the marketing guys really wanted to have customer loyalty in their model. And so you can see now I have one, two, three leaves. And maybe what I want to do is just use this shallow decision tree and actually derive a leaf ID where I have an indicator that indicates one, two, three for each one of these terminal leaves. And then I can come over here and do something else like fit a logistic regression model. And again, I have not reloaded the data. It's all there, striped into memory. And I can just drag and drop organics. And then I can use that leaf ID as a predictor variable. Very easy to do. And notice that I get variable importance. I get the same kind of things that we saw here with assessment and also ROC and misclassification. And then I can also come over here and add other variables to see how well my model does, just again, very interactively, and understand what variables best describe organics purchases. Now, here, I'm kind of using the leaf ID. Sometimes people like to use as as an input as kind of a proxy for interaction terms without having to actually manually build them. What I like to do here is I would actually like to make this leaf ID variable, watch closely, a group by variable. And what I actually will do at that point is build a separate logistic model in memory for each one of those three terminal nodes. And again, sometimes forming these underlying stratum and then developing a separate model in each one of these stratum can end up providing us with better models. So that's a quick demo of that. And so I'm going to turn it back over to the guys. Uh, we're going to say a few things and then take questions. All right. So this was the, the organics purchase demo. And um, I think we just to, to wrap up, 
um, you know, SaaS with the Hortonworks data platform, I guess, you know, the, 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 the four things we want to emphasize is, you know, and I talked about it at the beginning, increases productivity for data scientists, uh, increases efficiency as, as you run this in memory and running it on Hadoop. Um, we can capture and analyze new data types and really leverage the, the you know, HDP, which is the 100% open source Apache Hadoop uh, with SAS together. Uh, Kim, you want to take over now or? Yeah, let me just do that really quickly. Click. I think the next slide is going to be around uh, lesson learned. Oh, first, if you can move next oh. to the next slide and how you should get started. Cool, yeah. Uh, so, you know, if, if you, you know, how should we get started? I just, I think this is really about, you know, the typical steps that you, that you take, um, when, when you're doing a project like this. So, as I said in the beginning, first you get the data, and the data lake concept is really taking off because, because of the efficiency and the reduced friction of getting the data. Getting the data from a hundred different sources in your organization is, is, a, is very hard. And once you put all the data in a data lake, you enable, you empower all the data scientists to sort of uh, use this data in ways that, uh, you know, are impossible before that. Uh, then you formulate a well-defined business objective. It's always important for us data scientists to understand that we do everything. We do all these cool algorithms in the context of the business, whether it's in healthcare or insurance or retail. There's some kind of business context and business objective. And if you formulate that correctly with you know, in an accountable manner, you, you get your results much better. Uh, then you explore the data, and in, interactive is a good way to do that. You can see what, what thing you can use, which data are, are you need to transform. Um, you then figure out, okay, this is kind of what I want to do. You pre-process the, the larger data set. Uh, you, you prepare all your feature matrix, um, and then you can run your modeling and evaluate your results. And when everything works out, you deploy it and you talk to your IT folks to help you migrate this into uh, into production. And with that, I think we'll um, we'll take questions here. Um, perfect. So we have we're running out of time, but you know there's a couple of things that we'd like you guys to kind of investigate. Um, you, if you need more information about the partnership, go ahead and uh, access it through the partner page on hornworks.com slash partner staff. And then we do have this thing called the Hornworks Sandbox. So it's a virtual machine that you can download on your laptop and start using HDP, right? And within the sandbox, there's tutorials that you can use, and you can also use our partner tutorial to connect it to different type of uh, visualization tools and BI tools that um, we currently have on our website. So I really do recommend you to download the sandbox and start playing around, get yourself familiar with a do as you kind of go on to this um, data science big data journey that Ofer and Wayne talked about throughout the webinar. Um, so with that, there's a couple, there's a lot of questions. Let me kind of sum it up on, um, so this is for Ofer mostly, how do people get started in data science? You know, you talked a little bit about getting started for this webinar, but in general, what do they what do they need to learn in terms of language and what do they need to do in terms of, you know, actually put get the hands dirty? So good question, thank you. So, uh, you know, with with data science, it's data science is a kind of a, a really a combination in my mind of two really interesting skill sets. One is that of being a a really good software engineer or a data engineer, and then also uh, you know understanding machine learning, modeling, and that side. And sort of this combination is very powerful. To get started, there's a lot of ways. Uh, so first, my my first recommendation is always just you know get get your hands dirty. So if you think you want to learn a new language like Python, for example, which is very useful for data cleaning, go grab a book, take a take an online class, or take a class in university. Learn that and, and do a project. There's a website called Kaggle, uh, which hosts a lot of these data science competitions. And you don't have to participate in a competition. You can actually take one of the old competitions and and try that out. And and you learn a whole lot. You learn what you know and what you don't know and, and what needs to happen. Um, of course, you know, Hadoop is becoming a, a valuable tool in this ecosystem. So learning about Pig and Hive. Pig is a very, very useful tool uh, for processing large data sets. Uh, learning about Mahout, things like that. There's there's usually a lot of learning involved, but I can I can 
promise you uh, that it's it's a worthwhile effort to learn and grow in that in that way and learn new things. I learn new things all the time, and it's fun. Great, thank you. And I think this is for Wayne. I'm just going to consolidate all the questions. Um, since you call it statistics and, and memory analytics, how big is the data size you can handle? No physical limitation to the underlying size of the data that you can analyze. I mean, we commonly look at, you know, terabytes and as I was alluding to in some of the best practices, um, uh, you know, it's not just the number of rows of data, but it's the, the degrees of freedom of the number of discrete values you have for uh, variables in your model. And so um, things like recommenders that I showed probably are the most computationally expensive. So we find, too, that a lot of our customers in that case will develop models for very specific uh, segments of the business, you know, like men's clothing or women's clothing, jewelry, and things like that, an example with the department store. But, um, you know, that's kind of a tough question, and it just needs to scale. We do do some swapping back down to disk if the data is too large, and we work very close with Hortonworks as well to do performance management. We do integrate with Yarn today uh, from a resource management standpoint as well. Great. Um, the other question is, what other languages does SAS Studio support? What other languages does SAS Studio support? Well, first of all, um, SAS Studio um, supports just plain SAS. So you can write things, you know, like base SAS and your typical data step or macro programming language. And uh, there's something else called um, SAS University Edition. And so if you're a student or a professor working in research, not only teaching but research, you can actually go down, go out and download SAS Studio and SAS Stat and Base SAS and a couple other products uh, at no cost to you and try it out and do some of the things that Ofer talked about to be a good data scientist. Great. I think that the last question is, you know, are there any user license or um, um, just kind of um, not license that people can start using right away? It's, can they find that on the SAS website, Wayne? Um, right now, we don't have a trial by offer for the in-memory statistics for Hadoop. We'd like to do some of that. We've got a lot of videos out there. Um, you can take the visual analytics product, and there's a you know, try it, buy it type thing set up to where you can build some of those explorations I showed, including some of the topic analysis. Great. And I think one person that came in, she's, uh, he's pretty um, – he wants to ask if uh, if you can comment about using deep learning in recommend recommender systems. If you know anything about that. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when I was at um, uh, you know the machine learning conference and I had a workshop, um, I had a guy in there from uh, Baidu.com, and they actually develop. Uh, you can use predictive models for recommendations, and unfortunately, in a lot of cases, you need to build a model for each item, and you can imagine how many items there are at a place like LinkedIn or Baidu.com. And so people are actually use predictive models to generate propensity scores for each item and then rank order them based upon that list. And uh, deep learning's hot. Um, the nice thing about deep learning is it's going to allow for some of these nonlinear trends and so forth, and you are going to be able to add a lot more data besides the ratings data. You add other covariates like the profile history and so forth. So they do great. Um, you got to run those in a distributed way. You know, you need to go out and get your Hortonworks cluster and get something like SAS because um, these things take a lot of time to converge. They're very large, complex, complex networks. Great. Perfect, Wayne. All right, you guys, I know we have tons of questions, and I'm going to get together with Wayne and offer, offer and see if we can you know, address them uh, with you personally offline uh, via email. So with that, I'd like to thank our speakers. That was really informative and enjoy the demo uh, quite a bit. And if you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me. Again, the demo, the recording, the slides will be available on our website later this week. You guys will get a nice email from me um, to direct you to them. And if there are any questions, feel free to reach out to me, and I will get to them as soon as I can. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.